I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of Tech Field Day, and we're here in Austin, Texas with Store Magic. Around the table are a group of invited writers and speakers from around the world to ask questions and learn about the products. If you'd like to learn more about our event, just go to techfieldday.com, and you can find many more videos like this at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Hi, guys. So my name's Luke Pruin. and I'm the Technical Services Director at Store Magic. My main role there is really managing the pre-sales and support group, but really focusing on customer success, listening to customer feedback, and you know, really driving the product forward from that point of view. What I'm going to do is uh, we have some sections here I've broken, broken out. What I'd first like to talk to you is just give you an overview of uh, Stormagic SD SAN, just give you a bit of deeper understanding of the product, um, and then we'll follow on with uh, some, some further, de uh, sorry, deep dive sections into uh, some specifics. So what is SD SAN? So as Hans was mentioning, we provide highly available storage between two servers. So we do this, what we do is we deploy a virtual storage appliance out on top of a, a hypervisor. Um, you know, there's, there's many companies that have the same kind of uh, profile and what they would do, they may refer to these appliances as storage controllers amongst other things. Um, but the general concept here is what the, the appliance will do here, it will take advantage of the underlying storage in the host. So we're talking x86 platforms, um, so we don't care what the hardware is. We actually don't care what the storage is with inside um, the servers either. It could be SATA disks, SAS disks, SSDs. It could even be external JBOD arrays. So we don't have a strict requirement on the performance of the storage. All we want to do is actually see some disks in the underlying host. So these disks uh, will be assigned up to the appliance that is sat on top. And in turn, these appliances, when paired, are going to mirror the disks, the, the, the actual capacity of these disks between them, and present it out as iSCSI. So those capacities, if you, if you had, say, 10 terabytes in each server, those capacities could be presented out as a single 10 terabyte, um, highly available storage volume, or it could be broken up into many, depending on your um, sizing requirements for your virtual environment. Obviously, the, the aim here is to make this, uh, this environment resilient. So if one of the servers fails in this scenario, uh, we're going to see a VMware HA event, a fault tolerant event, or even Hyper-V. The synchronous mirroring is active-active. So what I mean by this is uh, essentially on top of this storage volume, so we're presenting out this iSCSI volume, you'd have a VMFS on top of there or a CSV under Hyper-V. As virtual machines are obviously writing down to the storage, it's going to hit uh, one side of the mirror, but also be committed to the other side. So we ensure that data, uh, the data writes are committed to both sides before acknowledging that write back up. Now, the beauty of having this two-way mirror, though, it means that we can actually isolate reads per the hosts as well. So reads can actually remain local and not actually traverse physical medium across the cluster. So if you had a VM on the, uh, the host one on this side, it can actually just read and it gets exclusive access to the underlying disks, thus giving us better read performance. And again, if you had a, a virtual machine on the second host, it also benefit from more disk spindles or the type of medium which is underneath. As I said, the storage is presented out as iSCSI, so we use standard multipathing. These are already built into the hypervisors, so VMware, Hyper-V, they all have their iSCSI initiators. But one thing that is quite interesting and a number of our customers actually do as well is present that storage then out to other machines on their network. So it might not actually be just solely for that hypervisor. They may be presenting that storage out from that cluster to a physical legacy, uh, a, a physical legacy machine that they can't virtualize amongst others. So very flexible on how the storage can be presented. It doesn't just have to be to that hypervisor. <clears throat> so when we're focusing on a two-node solution, um, and Hans is talking about uh, a number of our customers, they have a lot of sites. So when they're actually purchasing new hardware for the sites, not only, as Hans highlighted, we, they want to eliminate, say, a third piece of hardware, so having a three-node cluster, they want to reduce it to two, but they also want to simplify their networking. So we do this by enabling um, a crossover network on the back end. So if you've got two hosts, you have an uplink to your, uh, your network on site, okay, to a physical switch. So terminals, whatever uh, is running there can actually access those virtual machines. But the data network, we actually want to isolate on the back end. So this would be the iSCSI traffic, so us presenting the storage up to the hypervisor, and the mirroring, so the, the hosts are in sync. So these can just be directly connected cables between the hosts. The racks will probably, uh, sorry, the servers will probably be in the same rack, and we'll literally just have patch cables between the hosts to isolate this network. 
You can add uh, additional patch cables, connections in between, and what we'll actually do is aggregate the bandwidth of those connections automatically to give you larger throughputs depending on what uh, your uh, storage requirements are. This means that you don't necessarily have to jump to a 10 gig requirement. You could actually start with one gig on the back end, and you could use multiple one gig connections to provide you that throughput, which may be more cost effective. The reality is these servers are all coming with a large amount of onboard one gig NICs, so you don't need to buy additional adapters to go into these hosts. So from a, a requirements point of view, like I said, there's a virtual storage appliance sat on the hypervisor. So our requirements are specifically low. So we've designed this from the ground up to actually focus these remote branch office locations uh, where you know, we may not have the top high-end processors that are available, uh, but you can scale the appliances depending on your performance needs. Generally what we'll do though is we'll start with a single CPU of two gigahertz for that appliance, and it only requires one gig of memory, and we can start with a gig networking. So we have very, very small footprint for that appliance to achieve the performance that we do. As I mentioned earlier, the underlying storage can be whatever you want, SAS, uh, SATA, SSD, uh, external JBOD arrays, and we do have optional caching technologies. So we, we have a, a number of licensing tiers, starting with standard and going to advanced, and the difference between these would be uh, additional features, including caching, where you can leverage SSD and memory uh, you know, to, to cache hot data, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Does anybody have any questions on that before I, I continue? Yeah, but how do you present up that, that storage? Do you actually use the hypervisor to present storage into the VSA or do you pass through the storage controllers? Sure, so a, ge a general makeup for our customers, if you've got uh, an x86 platform, they will actually use RAID on the disks to provide them additional redundancy. So if we had two hosts, an easy example is to have, say, a RAID 5 group set in each one, and then that RAID 5 group set can be assigned to the appliance, either using something called uh, raw disk mappings under right. VMware, pass-through under Hyper-V, where simply you get exclusive access to that storage. A symbolic link is, is created between, but it, it, it removes really any overhead that's in between. Now, we could also just format that, that RAID group with a file system, VMFS uh, or NTFS under, under Windows, and just create a virtual disk on there. Uh, that does come with a little bit more complexity because you have additional layers, but we've seen uh, a lot of customer success in doing this where they have environments where they've actually already been deployed and they've got several servers there. They want high availability, but they don't want to go through a, hu uh, a huge hardware refresh. So all they do is deploy our appliances out there, create a virtual disk on their VMFS, which is already there, and then we make it highly available so they don't have to go through a whole storage refresh to, to achieve it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Brilliant. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. So are you, manual, so are you creating the RAID groups then when you are presenting out as an iSCSI target? Is that what you're saying? So the, the RAID group would be physical within the server. So okay. the underlying disks, there would be a RAID controller, and, and you would choose a, you know, the best RAID uh, setting for, for whatever your environment needs. So are you able to then, I guess, mix and match what's being used for, for virtualization and what's being used as an iSCSI target for physical servers? Correct, yeah. Okay. Are you dedicating an entire disk for that, though? Or are you... So I, I guess that's kind of my, um, my concern or question. So if I have a minimum number of, or minimal number of disks available in my, in my server to use for virtualization and then also as an iSCSI target for physical, are we... So let's say I have five disks available total um, for capacity. How do I have to use all five of those? Or can I, using slices of those disks, for capacity for iSCSI? Yeah, you could. So um, if, I, if I'm understanding you clearly, so if, if you had a five disks, mm -hmm. let's say we just put a RAID group on there, under RAID you can present those up as virtual disks or LUNs in their own rights. Mm -hmm. So if, say for arguments, you've got uh, five terabytes, you could present those as a subset of virtual disks from the RAID controller. On okay. top of that, within VMware, I mean, you, you could have five VMFSs, you could have um, a single VMFS and then present the others up to our appliance, which in turn can represent it as iSCSI. So when you're doing it for virtualization, you're, you're, determining, the, for the, you're determining the disk protection, I guess, policy that you're going to end up using. So whether it's going to be like a RAID 5 or a RAID, you know, RAID 1, RAID 0, something like that. That's or, technically not, you know, because it, it's the underlying hardware. Right. It can get specified. Now, uh, Jason's actually going to go through um, 
provisioning them on a UCS platform. Okay. And through that, it will be the automation of actually configuring this underlying storage and then us going through a deployment there on top to automate it end to end. Okay, maybe I'll understand a little bit better then. Okay. Okay. All right. So, one of the um, highlights for our product is our witness. So, we have something we, we recall, we refer to it as a neutral storage host in NSH. Um, essentially, this is a witness um, to help protect that cluster. Well, I just want to give you a little bit more detail about that. So, when you, when you have a two node cluster, and we're essentially writing data down to both sides. If you were into a situation where perhaps you got network isolated and you allowed the data still to continue to change, when they actually, those two nodes reconnect, you're gonna have differences on each side and how do you reconcile something like that? So pretty much what you're gonna do is you're gonna end up either with corruption or you're gonna to have to take the volumes offline, bring up virtual machines, compare them and make sure that you're happy with the data. So, this isn't anything new, so what you, what you would normally do is this. You need an odd number of nodes, you have a third point of contact, so if you have a failure, you have a majority vote. So two out of three know that they're in a good place, they'll continue to operate, okay? Does anybody have any questions so far? So, as I was saying, so this is a witness, we refer to ours as a neutral storage host, but because we started uh, designing our product, looking at these uh, edge cases, these wind farms, these oil rigs, robo environments, what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to detach that witness from that remote location and centralize it for the customer. So they don't have to have a third, point, um, a, a third piece of hardware on that site. So what we had to do by doing that though was to actually take into account the WAN links that, were, that are available today and the connections that could be hooking these sites back up to the data center and all of the things that come with them, so low bandwidth and latency. So with that in mind, what we can do, a connection to uh, a remote site, say all the way back in England, uh, and the witness running here can sustain 3,000 milliseconds of latency on a round trip. Yeah, so three seconds. So th this, this, is, this is a huge number in the terms of computing and even with uh, WAN links. It can, it can sustain a 20% packet loss. So, you know, if, if links are, are having poor connectivity and we're dropping packets throughout, it can still cope and still continue working with that. And the connection only requires nine kilobits. So this is a very small percent of generally what is available to us with uh, these connections that we have today. One of the uh, real highlights here as well, the witness relationship can be one to a thousand. So we could have one witness running in a remote location and, and a thousand clusters spread out using that single witness entity uh, as, the, as the, the arbitrator should there be a failure. Does anybody have any questions on that? Is that thousand an entirely arbitrary number? Uh, we've tested up to a thousand, so it, it may well go beyond, but <laughs> you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, so. But you're only using this essentially as, as there's a, a, a health heartbeat to it and, and used at a split brain Correct. Operation. Yeah. So in the, I'll, I'm going to actually use the whiteboard in a second and we'll, we'll talk through a scenario where we have some failures and what actually happens. Uh, I'm curious what the uh, upper limit is that you've tested with the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> so a little bit intriguing to me. Yeah, it's no, it's, 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 it's a really good use case because a lot of people are always intrigued by the, the Raspberry Pi. So, um, but just to set, so the witness as well, uh, we support it on a number of platforms. You can install it on a Windows server as a Windows service, okay? Uh, this really came from the fact that uh, VMware vCenter was on a Windows machine. We just installed it by default, okay? Um, but you can, you can detach it from that and install it onto another Windows machine. So in a lot of these locations, if perhaps the customer doesn't want to do it, they often have a back-end um, office machine for the manager. So it could be installed there, for example. Uh, we have an NSH appliance. So that's a dedicated light footprint appliance that is just deployed into a data center and it's kind of a set and forget. Uh, people tend to reboot Windows and we don't want it going up and down as much as we possibly can. Incidentally, we do install on the uh, Linux VCSA from VMware as well. We also have a Linux Debian package if you want to install it onto a Linux system. But the Raspberry Pi model actually came up from a customer that um, they had you know, poor WAN connectivity, but they were out of connection for long periods of time. This is essentially a shipping company with cruise ships, and they had a satellite uplink. But they would see uh, periods of hours where they would ha actually have no connectivity back to site. So what was the most inexpensive way for them to achieve it? 
$30 buy a Raspberry Pi, a bit of sticky tape on the side of the rack, and they, they, had, their, they had their witness on site. So it, it worked perfectly for them, and it, it's something that all, everybody always um, uh, shares great interest in it. To, to answer your question about an upper limit on the Raspberry Pi, um, I'm assuming that it would still be up to 1,000. Um, I can go back and find that out, but um, I don't see any reason why there wouldn't be because of the light footprint that we actually require. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I mean, I guess I wasn't sure how much processing power per cluster, mm -hmm. I suppose, and how much traffic, mm -hmm. you, know, cons you know, constant traffic you're generating. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously there's an upper limit to anything. So, but so, so essentially what you're going to see is you're going to see a heartbeat every second or so uh, up to, and we'll grow that window if the connection starts getting bad, and we'll kind of grow that connectivity up to the 3,000 milliseconds where it's, where it's a cutoff. Um, with that in mind... Uh, the appliance itself, which is the general favor, uh, flavor that the large distributed enterprises are deploying, has um, a one gig processor and 512 mega RAM. So, and that, that's achieving, achieving 1,000 locations. Okay? So the interesting thing with um, all the questions that I really get most asked is, uh, what about the failures? What if I lose my WAN connectivity? How does this affect my cluster? What if I then lose another server? These kind of questions like that. So I'll, I'll just go through a couple of scenarios. So if we have our witness device, uh, we've got a pretty cloud, which doesn't look so pretty. And then we have our hosts out at our remote location. So if we're to lose the witness, either our WAN connectivity goes down or the actual witness goes down in the data center for whatever reason, as I was saying, we're looking for a majority here. So we, we, we basically cast a vote. Do we have um, a majority vote to stay online? And in this case, even though that we actually have our WAN link down, the uh, two hosts at that remote location know that they have majority, so they can continue to operate, they continue to serve their storage, okay? So that, that's one scenario. Now, the thing is what, what gets a little bit more interesting, sorry? The thing that gets a little bit more interesting is then subsequent failures thereafter, okay? So if we have our witness, that's much better, thank you, Hans. Another cloud, we have our hosts at the remote location. Um, and let's say that we actually have a WAN outage and then we actually have a host outage. Now, this is the worst possible scenario and in this event we will actually take the storage offline to prevent any, any issues because this, this surviving host actually can't logically handle this because basically it's the last one that is available, it doesn't know if it's isolated. Now, from an admin point of view, you could intervene and you could uh, essentially just tell it to bring the storage up if, if you can get the connectivity there. Um, that one I haven't actually, I think I've seen it once in about five years, okay? And it, it was just a very brief outage. So how do you handle it when you lose the connection between host one and host two, but only for replication? So what we do is we actually have an, uh, an emergency connection. So if you remember in the diagram there, I had an uplink to the switch, mm -hmm. and I also had the back-end connections. So what you're telling uh, the scenario here is that we've lost the two back-end connections, yeah. but we actually have a, a management connection on here where they can still communicate. So and you it, can still do replication over that? Th there's or? two options, actually. Okay. So you can actually set that connection to failover, Mm -hmm. um, so in an emergency <coughs> state, we'll just take advantage of that and we'll start using it for mirroring. Okay. Okay? The beauty of that is if we can still run the mirror traffic here because we're iSCSI, each host has connectivity to the storage of each local VSA. Mm -hmm. And if they're in sync, it just traverses the internal virtual network stack. Okay. Okay? Um, some people may not want mirror traffic running across their production network, and in which case you can choose it not to do that. And then in that event, Basically, there will be in the underlying mechanics that there's a, essentially a, a leader slave. Uh, it doesn't affect data, but it's just for the logical handle. The slave will be told to, to take itself offline. Okay. okay. So the main one that we see, though, is um, connectivity. So if I've got host one and host two, we've got our connections. And what actually happens here is that, okay, so we have a hardware failure. One of our servers goes down, we actually lose uh, whatever, we may lose a disk, there's a hardware fault for whatever reason. Uh, maybe somebody just rebooted it. 
Then thereafter, we actually have WAN connectivity issues. So the NSH, the witness goes down, or this one uh, goes up and down. In that scenario, and this is the most common scenario with the customers, this guy can actually remain online, okay? And he will continue to serve up his storage and it will not impact the environment. So in this, this case, we've actually handled two additional failures across a three node cluster, which I, um, I'm pretty sure that nobody else can actually do. Mm. Now, the reason we can do that is it can be logically handled, right? So if we lose this host, the witness, and host two actually say, okay, I actually know that I've lost host one, then we lose the witness link, so host two goes, well, I know I was the last one in connectivity to the witness, and should host one come up whilst I can't talk to it, the witness would tell it not to come online because he knows that we are the one in the last good state. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So if you lose, oh, I was gonna say, if you lose, if you don't lose the witness first, the host will know that it's still up. But Correct. if you lost the witness first and then you lost the other host, yeah. it has no idea whether it's up or it's the one that went exactly. down. Exactly, yeah, you got it. So the other solutions, so there are, there are technologies out there now um, that do, the, the do a two server. There's some, there's some large vendors that do it, but because they've uh, started up at the data center and pushed it down market, these things haven't been covered. You know, they have much higher bandwidth requirements, latency requirements, and they can't handle all the way down to the failures that we can. But this is because of what, where we focused and you know, we've, we thought about this customer use case. Is the witness um, like stateless, or is there a database or anything on it? Like, if there, there is, this went down, and I just happen to have like a spare Raspberry Pi that I could just throw up and put it into there, and you know, re-put the witness on it. Uh -huh. Do I have to do anything? Do I have to copy anything out of the old one? No, no. So we, we actually have um, a discovery mechanism, which identifies our technology, our appliances out on the network. So if you to plug in a new one, it will basically be able to find. Um, so I don't even have to tell it that there's a new witness, it'll add a new IP or? You would have to tell the appliances to use the new witness. Okay, it wouldn't okay. figure out that the new one's. No, no, no. 